the longest arch bridge in the world and a spectacular suspension bridge, each designed to conquer breathtaking distances and withstand typhoons and earthquakes. They're part of the greatest bridge building boom ever in the planet's fastest growing nation, China. What does it take to build the world's impossible bridges? China is undergoing a transformation unlike any other country in history. In just a decade, it has created a web of roads and bridges second only to the United States. But unlike the US, China has two of the world's longest rivers, rivers that divide the country and disrupt travel by land. The creation of bridges is vital to this exploding economy. But China's rivers are a bridge builder's nightmare. The waterways are churning with shipping traffic which cannot be delayed. The rivers here are swift, deep and wide. Their muddy soil can swallow bridge foundations. and it gets worse. Typhoons, 240 kilometer an hour winds. Earthquakes can also strike at any time, registering 7.0 on the Richter scale. These challenges baffled China's engineers for centuries. But today, they're meeting them head on, erecting some of the world's most spectacular spans. One of the most daring is Shanghai's Lupu Bridge, the longest arch bridge in the world. Thirty-four million kilograms of steel soaring over the busy Huangpu River. The Lupu's arch rises more than 90 meters. 120 cables hang down from the arch to hold the roadway. The arch spans the entire river, 550 meters, with no support from below. It stands today as a masterpiece of bridge construction. But initially, erecting a bridge of this kind and this size was a daunting challenge. It wasn't designed until the city was desperate for a bridge. In 1999, Shanghai's population was approaching 13 million and China's largest city was bursting at the seams. Fleets of cars clogged the streets. City planners needed to ease the congestion, but the Huangpu River was in the way. It completely divided the city in half. A new bridge would help Shanghai grow, but building one would be a major challenge. The river was nearly half a kilometer wide. A new bridge would need to be designed so as not to sink into the Huangpu's muddy soil or block the river, one of China's busiest. The ship traffic would have to keep flowing. There was one cost-effective solution, a cable-stayed bridge. In this design, the roadway is suspended by cables that are attached directly to enormous towers. cable-stayed bridge could easily stretch across the Huangpu River, but Shanghai already had three cable-stayed bridges. City officials wanted something special. 
more than just a bridge. They wanted a monument. They made a radical decision. Shanghai would build an arch bridge, one bigger than any ever attempted. It will be easier to build a cable state bridge. But Chinese always like arch bridges. Chinese has been building arch bridges for 1,500 years. In the Lupu's design, the roadway would hang on cables attached to the arch. Without the arch, the roadway would sag and collapse under its own weight. But an arch doesn't sag. The downward forces try to make the arch spread out. So as long as the bases of the arch can be kept in place, the arch will remain standing. For a quarter of a century, the New River Gorge Bridge in West Virginia had held the record as the largest arch bridge in the world. This record had never been challenged before because building this big was difficult and dangerous. And building even bigger would magnify every problem. But the Chinese were not deterred. In October 2000, construction on the Lupu Bridge began. Workers drove in the piles that would support the ends of the bridge. Steel workers fashioned the first of the arch's 64 segments. The design was extremely complex. It called for twin arches that angled inwards. Workers had to make each segment to different specifications, depending on its place in the bridge. When each segment arrived on site, giant hoists slowly raised them into position. This was a tricky operation. Some segments weighed as much as 150,000 kilograms. Every time workers added a new segment, the hoist would slide forward right over it, ready to lift the next segment. As the arch grew, engineers faced the challenge of keeping it upright. Without support, the two sides would fall into the river. But scaffolding would block the shipping channel. The builder's solution was to hold the arch from above. First, workers erected temporary towers, more than 120 meters high, at each end of the bridge. They attached steel cables from the towers to the arch. Two cables supported each arch segment. The arch rose, piece by piece, towards the middle. Additional cables kept the towers from toppling. The bracing was so extensive, it was almost like building a second bridge, a cable-stayed bridge that would be dismantled once the arch bridge was complete. But until the arch was finished, this was a precarious system, and with each step, the arch grew increasingly vulnerable. An arch is only a viable structural system after the ends of the arch are connected together. The two ends uh, not only are unstable in the vertical direction because they aren't taking compression, but they're also very susceptible to wind. The builders had to try to close their arch as soon as possible. But it was slow going. The design called for the bridge segments to be welded together from the inside. The space was cramped and the ventilation was poor. The welding torch heated the air to 60 degrees Celsius. It was so hot that the welders could work for only 15 minutes at a time. And to complete the bridge, they needed to make over 300 kilometers of welds. Outside, surveyors made sure that the arch stayed on track. Gravity, air temperature and wind were always at work, changing its size and position. If the engineers miscalculated, the final segments would not fit 
meaning the arch couldn't be closed. Instead, it would be left dangerously exposed and a typhoon could strike at any time. At least two typhoons hit this region every year. The winds of a major typhoon could easily wrench open weak joints, shake apart a support tower or snap cables. The weight of the arch would do the rest. The entire bridge could plunge into the river. Before building began, the Lupu's designers tested a model of their bridge against the forces of a 7.0 earthquake and 270 km an hour typhoon winds. The tests predicted that the arch could survive nature's worst, even when incomplete. But the builders wouldn't sleep soundly until they had closed the arch. The budget, the schedule, and the safety of the entire project were riding on the outcome. And the bigger the arch, the more that can go wrong. Anytime you build a bridge out of segments that are put up one after the other, there's a chance that when you get to the middle, the last piece isn't the perfect fit. After going well for months, construction now appeared to slow. One Shanghai paper reported a delay due to technical difficulties. They have a little uh, trouble at the end when they trying to fit uh, the last piece in there. So it was stopped for a while. The Lupu's senior designer denied there was a problem. Still, the bridge sat, unfinished and fragile, and a destructive typhoon was approaching. By July 2002, almost two years into construction, China's Lupu Bridge loomed over Shanghai's skyline, but it was still incomplete. The bridge was now at its most vulnerable and at the worst possible moment. Typhoon Ramasun was brewing in the Pacific, just 130 kilometers away from the city. For 24 hours, the storm pelted China's coast. The high winds knocked down trees, demolished homes, and pummeled the unfinished Lupu Bridge. Five people in the city were killed. Then the typhoon turned north and disappeared. This time, the Lupu supports held. The bridge was unscathed. But the builders knew they might not be so lucky next time. They needed to close their arch before another typhoon hit. Engineers finally had the arch's last section ready for installation. The final piece began the journey to the top. The builders couldn't be certain it would fit perfectly, even after they had slid it into place. Workers quickly welded one side of the section but on the other side, the gap was too wide. They needed to wait until the outside temperature rose. This would cause the steel arch to expand and the gap to close. At exactly 20 degrees Celsius, the gap did close. This last joint was sealed with permanent bolts. Finally, it was time to celebrate. But the giant arch was not yet out of danger. Engineers still needed to prevent it from pushing outward into the riverbank's soft soil and collapsing. Arch bridges like the New River Gorge are braced at each end by solid rock. The load of the heavy arch pushes outward against the rock, but the stone does not budge. 
and that force keeps the bridge erect. But the soil of the Huangpu River was too soft to resist the Lupu's weight. The ends would slide apart and the arch would collapse unless the engineers lashed the ends together. This is known as a tide arch. The builders stretched 16 cables between the arch bases. Eight cables would remain visible after the bridge was finished. The other eight would be hidden inside the road spans. Together they would act like the string on an archer's bow. Without their constant force, the arch would flatten. So when you have a loading on the arch, it creates a very high horizontal force, pushing the end of the, the bridge away. So we put a cable to tie them together so that this horizontal force is acting against each other in the cable. Maintenance crews will need to keep a close eye on the cables for as long as the bridge is standing. They will regularly test the tension to make sure it stays at about 22,000 tons. The Lupu Arch was now ready to carry the load of the roadway. Workers began to raise the 15 road deck sections. This was another heavy job. Some sections weighed 450,000 kilograms. For this step, the Huangpu River was not an obstacle. It was an asset. It allowed the enormous road spans to be floated to the construction site on boats. This was far easier than bringing them over land. On the 28th of June, 2003, the Lupu Bridge opened, two and a half years after construction started. The contractors had met their deadlines, despite the delays. Shanghai now had a showpiece, as well as a vital new traffic route. And China had its first record-setting span, the longest arch bridge ever built. But this victory was quickly overshadowed by China's insatiable need for bridges. The Chinese want to link their entire nation to form one modern economy. It was hard enough conquering the Huangpu River, which sliced Shanghai in half. But China had another river that cut the whole country in half. The Yangtze is China's longest river and the third longest in the world. It once divided China geographically and economically, a 6,300 kilometer obstacle to China's growth. Three hours west of Shanghai, the Chinese began to bridge this divide with one of their greatest mega spans yet. A suspension bridge called the Rin Yang. The Ring Yang needed to leap three times further than Shanghai's Lupu Bridge, more than a kilometer in a single bound. It would be the longest bridge the Chinese had ever built, and the third longest suspension bridge in the world. Its enormous twin towers would climb over 200 meters into the air. For residents on the Yangtze's north side, the bridge would mean faster and safer travel to Shanghai and a chance to share in China's new wealth. The north bank was cut off from Shanghai by the Yangtze. But now the Rin Yang would replace a ferry ride that could take two hours with a 10 minute drive.
In 1998, designers began to address the idea of bridging the Yangtze between the ancient cities of Yongzhou and Zhenjiang. But immediately they encountered a problem. Building a bridge directly between the two cities was impossible because the cities themselves extended right to the riverbanks. There was no extra room in which to add a bridge. Designers were therefore forced to build the bridge to the west, but here the gulf between shores more than doubled. Building the bridge here would demand three megastructures, a 400-meter bridge to the north, an elevated highway across the small island, and a massive bridge to the south. The Yangtze was a difficult place to build one bridge, let alone two. The current was swift and the soil was unstable. And every summer the Yangtze flooded, often with disastrous results. A deluge just months before construction started inundated an area larger than England. If there was a severe flood during construction of the Rin Yang, it could cripple the project. Builders tackled the North Bridge first, where the shorter distance made their job easier. They erected a cable-stayed bridge, the cheapest and simplest design. The roadway was supported by cables attached directly to two towers. This 400-meter structure had no trouble spanning the river's north channel. Cable-stayed bridges had been built at a twice the length needed here. It was a huge construction project, but not record-breaking. The state-of-the-art design looked stunning, both day and night. But the builders of the South Bridge faced far greater challenges. The distance they had to build across was almost four times as far. Too far for a cable-stayed bridge to reach without putting several towers in the river. And engineers couldn't put any bridge towers in the Yangtze. The South Channel was the main shipping route around the island. There was a constant crush of boats. If just one vessel strayed off course and rammed a bridge pier, the damage would potentially be catastrophic. Engineers learned this the hard way when a ship collision destroyed a bridge and lives in the United States. The Chinese engineers faced a long list of challenges in their attempt to bridge the Yangtze River. The water was over a kilometer wide, and typhoons and earthquakes could strike at any time. But by far the biggest threat to the bridge was a wayward ship. In Florida in 1980, the 20,000-ton Summit Venture destroyed the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. The ship was navigating Florida's Tampa Bay in bad weather. It lost radar, veered off course, and slammed into a bridge support. The central span collapsed. The crash killed 35 people, including 26 traveling on a bus that careened off the bridge. The Rin Yang's builders did not intend to risk such a tragedy. They would base as much of their bridge on land as they could, and only one design could leap the huge distance and keep the towers near shore, a suspension bridge. The design for the Rin Yang, like every modern suspension bridge, relied on two main cables that stretched from one shore to the other. At each end, the meter-thick cables were rigidly anchored. But everywhere else, the main cables could and would move, even across the top of the towers. 
The towers were like tent poles, propping up the cables. But the cables were simply draped over the top. If the main cables were anchored to the tower tops, the towers would not be able to withstand the pulling forces. They would tumble inwards and the entire structure would be lost. Hanging down from the main cables were 360 suspender cables. These would hold the road spans. And these joints were also made to move. This flexibility would help the bridge to survive extreme poundings from earthquakes and typhoons. If the Brin Yang could be built as designed, it would be the third longest suspension bridge in the world. It would have towers that soared 70 stories and a span that would stretch almost one and a half kilometers. Only one tower would sit in the Yangtze River. Just two other bridges in the world had longer spans, Denmark's Great Belt and Japan's Akashi Kikyo. Construction of the Rinyang Bridge began in February 2001. The project was so important to China that President Zhang Zemin himself attended the groundbreaking. The builders had five years to complete the project. The first step was the bridge towers. Because the towers needed to withstand tremendous downward forces from the cables, engineers wanted to plant them on bedrock. But the Yangtze mud was incredibly thick. To reach solid footing, the builders needed to sink 32 piles at each tower site. These piles would act like giant stilts, standing on the bedrock below and supporting the 200-meter towers above. This was a critical step to ensure that the towers remained upright. If they started to tilt, there could be no stopping them. Before builders could finish the bridge, they needed to solve another critical problem. It was imperative that the anchor blocks that held the main cables were not able to move. But the ground here was so muddy and weak that the cables could have pulled the anchor blocks out of place. Overcoming this weak link would be the most difficult and dangerous job of the entire project. China's Rinyang Bridge would be the third longest suspension bridge in the world. Loads on its main cables would be enormous. The cables would tug at their anchor blocks with the force of 68 million kilograms. Designers needed to prevent the anchor blocks from moving or the bridge could collapse. To do this, builders would have to extend the anchor blocks at least 30 meters underground. They would be the largest anchor blocks the Chinese had ever built. But when engineers probed the riverbank, they discovered that the soil was worse than muddy. It was laced with underground water. This was a major setback. Engineers would have to find a way to divert the groundwater, or watery mud would pour into any hole they dug. And it could enter so fast that it would trap the men working inside. The engineers devised a plan. they decided to keep the water at bay by erecting a gigantic underground dam. 
All around the 3,400 square meter site, workers dug a series of trenches. They filled the trenches with rebar and concrete. The walls kept the water out, making it safer to dig within. But there was still a problem. North Shore workers were using China's only deep trench digger. So on the South Shore, the contractors were forced to take a riskier approach. They decided to control the deep underground water by freezing the ground. To do this, they needed to construct a huge refrigeration plant. The plant chilled salt water to minus 20 degrees Celsius. Salt water has a much lower freezing point than fresh. Pipes circulated the water more than 30 meters down, all around the site. This system worked like the coils in a giant freezer. The ultra-cold water froze the soil into a meter-thick wall, and these walls of icy dirt kept the water out. With groundwater no longer circulating inside the two sites, the soil became safer to dig. The excavation went on 24 hours a day, as the crews tried to finish before the summer floods threatened to fill their excavation site with water. These enormous pits would descend at least 30 meters, but every four meters, workers needed to stop to pour concrete braces. The deeper the workers went, the more dangerous the job became. Groundwater was constantly pushing the walls towards collapse, and the deeper the hole, the stronger the pressure. The deeper you do dig, the more freezing you have to do. And uh, oh, when it gets very deep, then actually water can come from the bottom, and it can come very, very quick. Six months after digging began, the two anchorages plunged at least nine stories. They looked like parking decks and were each large enough to park 7,000 cars. Hundreds of men now worked at the two vulnerable sites and the danger was about to escalate. Monsoon season and its flooding were just weeks away. Building China's longest suspension bridge required constructing two of the country's biggest anchor blocks. The blocks needed to hold the massive main cables securely or the entire bridge would collapse. So far, workers had excavated 280,000 cubic meters of dirt. But engineers now decided it was too risky to continue. They ordered the crews to the next stage of construction. Workers filled both anchorages with ballast, 310,000 cubic meters of concrete and sand. The Rin Yang's engineers had won their first race against the tumultuous Yangtze and escaped a disaster. Eleven months later, the region saw the worst rains in five years. But by the time the flood did hit, workers had moved on to building the above ground part of the anchor blocks, where the cables would attach. But you can't just hook the end of a main cable into the concrete, it would pull right out. So as each cable entered the anchor block, it fanned into 184 bundles. The cable spread from one meter to nine meters wide. 
This distributed the pulling force across 83 square meters. Each cable bundle was separately anchored in concrete. It was a forest of steel strands, and it was all extremely vulnerable to rust. To protect it, the anchor block was sealed airtight. The atmosphere was constantly dehumidified, so rust couldn't form. From the anchor blocks, the cables climbed to the top of the bridge towers and across the river. Each cable weighs over 20 million kilograms, too heavy to put in place straight away. Builders would have to string them one strand at a time. First, they took a guide cable across the river by boat. To do this, they needed to block all ship traffic. They would later use this steel rope to pull more lines across. It took 12 hours to get the rope up and over the towers, but once the task was done, they could open the river. Workers slowly built on the guide rope. They created a catwalk high above the water. They used this platform to string the cables, one bundle at a time. Each wire in these bundles was made of ultra-strong steel, so strong that just one could lift three cars. The contractor had pre-cut every wire to a specific length. The builders would have to replace any that fell short at a cost of millions. Every cable in that bundle is, has a different length. We have a lot of faith in the computation we do today to predict the, the length, but of course there's always uh, the risk of we made a mistake. 24 hours a day, workers continued to install the Rinyang's main cables. Many of these men had migrated from mountain regions because of the $200 a month they could earn here. They needed to be in excellent physical shape and have nerves as strong as the cables they were stringing. It took seven months to string all 368 bundles. Workers compressed the bundles into two giant cables. The 47,000 steel wires they contained strung end to end would circle the earth three times. Workers wrapped each bundle with an interlocking steel band then painted it to keep out moisture. The finished cables were almost a meter thick and two and a half kilometers long. They were the bridge's most expensive parts and perhaps the most important. Whole weight of the whole bridge is hanging up on those main cables. Because of the length of those suspension bridges, that could be a very large force. The cable's greatest enemy will always be the moisture that causes rust. To protect them, the builders installed dehumidifiers to pump dry air into their housing. Few bridges have this state-of-the-art system. It should keep the cables corrosion-free for at least 120 years. China is building 40,000 kilometers of roads and bridges every year. This nation now consumes a third of the steel produced on Earth, 
and it uses half the world's concrete. This building boom may be the biggest in history. Almost three years after construction began on the Rinyang, workers were ready to attack the final stage, raising the road deck. The design of these steel boxes was critical. It could determine if the Rinyang would survive for decades or quickly fall apart. This happened to one suspension bridge in the United States. In July 1940, the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in Washington State opened to traffic. At the time, it was the world's third longest suspension bridge. Right from the beginning, it had a problem. Light wind would set it in motion. It quickly earned the name Galloping Gertie. Four months later, a gale of just 67 kilometers an hour made the bridge twist and undulate. The motion fed on itself, amplifying to a catastrophic condition called flutter. After a few hours, the bridge could take no more. The Tacoma Narrows Bridge was doomed because its road span was too flexible. It could still be standing today if designers had stiffened the span with a truss, like the one below the world's longest suspension bridge, the Akashi Kikyo in Japan. China's Rinyang Bridge was nearly twice as long as the Tacoma Narrows. But engineers here had also opted for a deck design without stiffening trusses. Would flutter destroy the Rinyang? The Rinyang was designed to be China's longest suspension bridge, with a span nearly one and a half kilometers long. All of it exposed to high winds and even typhoons. But the builders were counting on a highly aerodynamic design to keep it steady. The steel boxes that made up the bridge span were just three meters high. They had slanted edges, like aeroplane wings, to allow wind to flow around them rather than push them into motion. In a giant wind tunnel, the builders blasted the design with typhoon force gales. The deck heaved, but there was no catastrophic flutter. Still, the Rinyang was entering a critical phase. Monsoon season was only five months away, and a suspension bridge with the deck incomplete was at its most vulnerable. You've got a bunch of girder segments that are almost dangling from the cable, and if the wind starts to blow too hard, then they'll start banging around and potentially damaging each other. The Rin Yang's builders now faced yet another race to the finish. They had special gantries made to speed up the work. The gantries rode the bridge cables and hoisted each road section into place. Ninety days after lifting the first slab, the Rinyang's road crew locked the last one into position. The 1,490 meter span, the third longest in the world, was complete. Almost immediately, the tough job of maintaining it began. Like the bridge cables, the span's 25,000 tons of steel can corrode. But the designers made it easy to inspect. A tiny electric car inside lets workers travel the entire length in about 18 minutes. In the shadow of the bridge is a high-tech control center. Sensors capture every move it makes and the Wen Yang is in constant motion.
This flexibility is unique to suspension bridges. It allows the massive structure to bend to Mother Nature's will, but not break. On the 30th of April 2005, China's longest suspension bridge opened to traffic several months ahead of schedule. It had taken four and a half years to build at a cost of 700 million US dollars. The region now had an economic lifeline between North and South and China entered the record books once again. But it's not stopping with the world's third longest suspension bridge or even the world's longest arch bridge. Much as the United States bridged the Mississippi in the 20th century, China is out to span the Yangtze in the 21st. Over the next two decades, the Chinese intend to build another 50 bridges over this river alone. China's most spectacular megabridge may be still to come.